So the, the thought that I had today, um, I feel like it's a thought not only for this church, but any church or any group of believers is getting to the simplicity of the gospel. I know it's a common thing I keep talking about, but and I've kind of brought out some things here in the past, but I'm going to start out with a few examples first before I go on into the scriptures, which I'm going to start at the book of, of, of Haggai, chapter 1. But the point of what I'm saying today is that everything, if it's not maintained, digresses. Everything that is not maintained and kept exactly the way that it starts, it'll either A, it will go downhill, or it will increase, it will increase into like a bizarre direction from there. And some of the things that I, I think about when I think about, you know, the simplicity of things going different directions. Uh, like, like I say, I brought some of this out before, but like when I was a kid, the first video game that they come out with was called Pong. And you, you let, when, when this first started out, the point being when, when Pong started out, everybody thought it was the greatest thing ever. It brought great joy, this playing this game Pong, where a little white paddle on a gray screen would knock the ball back and forth like he was playing tennis on a TV screen. But as we know, in the year 2019, this is probably going back to the, the late 70s or early 80s when this was invented. It digressed, or however you want to say it, progressed in some cases, but we've got 100% graphic games now. It looks like two human beings actually on a screen, uh, maybe fighting or hunting for something or going through the motion of a sport or whatever it might be, race car or whatever. But if you were to compare the original to what it became, there's no comparison because man always tinkers. Sometimes he'll tinker with things to the better, and sometimes he'll, most times he'll tinker with things to the worse. And so, uh, a second example, uh, go through these kind of quickly, because they're kind of self-explanatory, like sports. You know, sports in its simple, simplest form is, is a, in my way of thinking from my childhood, is a bunch of guys, uh, a bunch of kids. You got a football, and you get a captain, the captain's going to be the quarterback, and you're going to throw the ball, and you're going to have some sticks up for, uh, for the touchdown line and all that, and you're going to play football on the field, and you're going to have a blast. But it digresses or, or increases to the point that it became a multi-million dollar sport. Mm -hmm. And the beauty and the simplicity of someone playing out in the grass field with an old wore-out football is completely lost. Not even comparable to, say, somebody playing, playing an NFL game. So we see that things, if you want to keep the simplicity of the sport of football, it would have to be kept in a field with just a, a group of young boys and maybe a few girls playing a, a game together, uh, playing some football. If you want to keep it in its beauty and its simplicity, but it gets to the point that you need to you know the multi-million dollar cameras and you need the different angles and it. It progresses into something different is the main point. News, if you look at news from back in the 70s, it, well, there was a plane crash today. Look at news today, you know, it digressed into complete tabloid trash. Well, there was a plane crash, and that's because so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did this, and if so-and-so was not the president, and so-and-so wasn't in Congress, that plane would have never crashed. Some stuff that has nothing to do with that plane crash, but that's what becomes news. What is news digresses into something that completely is not really news. I like this one, and few people could probably follow this better than me, and maybe some of the country five people that were here. But you take something as simplistic as, as, as coon hunting. I've had coon hounds since I was a young boy, and I run in coon hounds. And I've, I've used this example here before of what happens. That years and years ago, people was happy with the coon dog. They could simply run a raccoon through the woods and run it up a tree, and they they go get the the game out of the tree and uh, and harvest it. 
Well, then they kept tinkering with these dogs because the thing called competition started occurring. That all these different people uh, wanted to have better dogs. And so what they wanted to increase the uh, the ability of the coon hound to treat a coon, and they made it. They kept doing it and doing it and, and making more pups out of them until they finally got these these hounds that absolutely almost do not even know how to chase after a coon. They're taught to run a brand, a fresh raccoon up a tree. They're not taught to go and find one there that was there, say, three hours ago and track it down. So the quality of what you say was a good coon hound is lost. You take, and this be my last example of how things digress. I say some of it's for the better, some of it may not be for the better, but just an example of how nothing remains the same if man gets his hands on it. I guess it would be the easiest way to state it. Nothing remains the same if man gets to tinker with it. Man is never satisfied unless they make it bigger, better, wider, taller, shorter, quicker, longer, whatever. Man is just never satisfied. If you take something simple, simple like being buried, 100, 200, 300 years ago, pine box was planting. Put some made a pine box, throw them in the ground, throw some dirt over them, put a, a headstone maybe, a marker, a, a cross made out of wood or whatever, just mark the grave and go on. And until I say today that because man wanted to get their hand in it, they wanted to, to try to so-called make burials better, you're going to pay five, six, seven thousand dollars for an elaborate box that will last, last hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And so, it's not for the, for the poor anymore. It's, uh, it requires a ball, it requires you know, the concrete. Man got their hands in on it and they made something very simple, very complicated. That being the point of, uh, I want to go ahead and bring this into the gospel here in just a few moments. Uh, over in the book of Haggai, in verse 2 of chapter 1, it said, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord, by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye that dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lies waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have so much, and you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with hose. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste. And ye run every man to his own house. All right, so we got the Lord talking about the house of the Lord lying in waste, while their houses that they live in aren't going to waste and how that they haven't considered the Lord's house and uh, then it goes on over into chapter 2 of Haggai verse 2 through 9 it says speak now to Zerubbabel the son of Shilatel governor of Judah and to Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest and to the residue of the people saying who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Verse 
Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains among you, fear ye not, for thus saith the Lord of hosts. Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And it, in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. In this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. So, so praise the Lord. We got the Lord here in the second chapter of Haggai talking about that he's going to uh, do, a, do a work here. He's going to... He's going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. He's going to shake the nations and the desire of all nations are going to come and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. This is a very prophetic uh, word that the Lord uh, no longer was going to, to dwell in a, in a made house of, of, of the laid out gold and the, and the tabernacle and the, the ark and all that different stuff that came with the house of God, but the Lord is going to create a new house and He's telling us here in this verse 9, he said, The glory of the latter house is going to be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place am I going to give peace, saith the Lord. Now over in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27 through 29, it just kind of tags along with that same thought. A lot of times there's two and three witnesses in the Bible of the same thought process, but over in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 27, it said, And this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So we're talking about a, a vision of simplicity today. I, I had wrote down and said, uh, the simple salvation plan I missed the other word. Bear with me. Salvation oh. Apologize. Couldn't read my own writing as the old expression goes. The simple salvation plan has morphed into a many splintered thing. I guess that would be uh, like a sentence kind of wrapping up everything that I was talking about in the beginning, how that man tinkers with something that's perfect and that was a good time and pleasurable and it becomes something more and more and more and more and more to what it, where the simplicity of what it began as is completely lost. And bringing this to the spiritual side, the simple salvation plan has morphed into a many splinter thing. You got people uh, that once you get full of the Holy Ghost are so uh, worried that, and, and I say it respectfully, and this is the part where I, I'm feeling God come on me on this. They'll start putting rules down. Well, yeah, well, right. You know, touch not, handle not, right. taste not. Don't do, be part of this. Don't do this. If you do this, you're not saved. If you do this, you're not saved, or, or after you're saved and you do this, apparently you aren't saved, and, and that there ought to be a fear all the time. And I believe that God in heaven looks uh, down on us, and, and in heaven, as far as being inside of our hearts, but they don't get it, that we're saved by grace through That's faith, right. and that not of works, lest any man should boast. It has nothing to do with how much, uh, how many times you pray. There, there's people that may pray uh, every day for hour upon hour upon hour. And there's people, I, I remember one time when I was working on the road that, 
that I, I went maybe a week or two without actually getting to spend a real solid, sincere time with God. And I remember spending time with Him in prayer at the hotel room when I was working on the road. And God said, I'm always here. Time, time means nothing to me. If you take two weeks before you speak to me, I don't sit and fret for two weeks saying, well, they haven't spoke to me for two weeks. I'm the eternal God. Once you're sealed... Once you're uh, completely mine, you're completely mine. I'm your God forever and ever and ever, and I'm going to wipe the tears away from your eyes. I do not leave nor forsake you. I am with you all, always, even into the end. But today's religion, it just seems like that there's so much discouragement has been taught amongst the people that the encouragement has been left out, the joy has been left out, the peace has been left out. I, I just never could understand that, that when somebody comes to God, it just comes in my mind, not, not even the Scriptures, in my mind to right now under the anointing, but, but when they brought the woman in adultery to Jesus' feet, and He said, you, you without sin cast yeah. the first stone in her, and said one by one they begin to drop out, and He said, woman, where's your accusers? Right. He said, go and yeah. sin no more. That's the way I look at God as yeah. we come to God and we get filled with the Holy Ghost. We are as sealed and as saved as we're ever going to be right. once we get sealed and filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, now we've got to pay attention, though, that just like that Scripture said, woman, go and sin no yeah. more. Yeah. Yes, we're to sin no more, but we are not perfect. When she got up, no doubt, maybe they had thrown a blanket over her. I don't know. But she was still a naked figure there. But she was saved because the Master had told her, woman, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. It doesn't matter how naked she was. She was clothed by the Master from on high. Yeah. This clothing goes deeper than clothes. This clothing goes deeper than, than the way we talk and the way we walk and the way that we conduct ourselves. It's the Holy Ghost. It's the shed blood of God yeah. that gives us the right to have the, the Spirit of God in us. And God looks on us and He doesn't see the sin in us. People, when are we going to start getting it that God didn't come to die at Calvary so that He could have a bunch of people getting saved and falling out all the time? What a weak salvation that would be if we all get saved and, and we all don't have the strength to abide in Him. But now I, I do know that the, the, the parable of the sower, it says, and the Word got it. The Word is like a seed that was sown and it says, some falls on stony ground. So you got to stay in this. You've got to have a desire to be in this. And maybe that's a place where the church of Jesus Christ is maybe not getting the message. I say that you need to weigh the full cost. You've got to count the whole cost. When you die out to God, you die out to Him. Right. Not only in doctrine, not only in the fact that you're willing to be baptized in His name and to be filled with His Spirit, but to die out to your flesh and the wants and the lusts thereof. You've got to be willing to understand you are dead to yourself once you are a servant of Jesus Christ. You are no more a servant unto the, and the sin once you're a servant unto righteousness. But the simple plan of salvation is morphed into a many splintered thing. And I thought, and, I, and forgive me church if you've heard me preach this before, say this, but it's got to be said, it always made me marvel as I went through the years of, of going and visiting different churches that the power of God would be all over me so strong that you couldn't do nothing with it. And you stand up and you testify, and you testify the power of God and the anointing of God. But Satan is always present. Satan would always be there. There would always be that one person that would stand up almost immediately behind you and say, and, and almost down your your whole uh, yeah. testimony by saying, well, we know it's not how loud you shout, but it's how you walk. And it would always frustrate me. of a, you're not going to shout under the anointing unless yeah. you're walking right, unless you're talking right, yeah. unless you're being right. You can't fake the anointing. You can't pull a wall over by it by God when it comes to the anointing. You either have God or you don't have God. There is no in between. But the devil gets jealous and he sees someone testify. He said, I've got to throw a wet blanket. I've got to deafen this. I've got to quench this. I've got to have one of my minions stand up and, and testify about it. You've got to be walking right before you can shout. And you know what that does? That makes the next person that wanted to testify to the anointing doubt their self and not stand up and shout and praise God under the anointing for fear of being judged by, by Mr. or Mrs. so-and-so back in the corner saying, well, they think that I'm saying that I'm righteous. And 
Well, yes, if you shout like this, if you have the ability to praise God without fear, you do have the anointing. You do have the unction. Yes, you And that's just one example of many I could give. One example of many I could give of how that the church has, has picked away and picked away and picked away and picked away. And it's ain't its own and it's, it's, it's gnashed on its own. The Bible says, be careful lest you gnash on one another right. at the end That's of right. time. Right. Be careful that we don't devour one another. I would to God that people would get some anointing, that people could get strength from the anointing. I know that, that uh, for the example that I'm giving, I know that the shouting isn't full salvation. That's just a byproduct of yeah. salvation. Yeah. I know that I could be a very quiet nature preacher and it still be God if it be of God. Yes, but I do know this, that when you truly get God in you, you're not going to be the same. There's going to be times that you're going to dance for glory. Yes. There's going to be times yes. that you're going to shout for glory. There's going to be times that you come to an old altar and you grab a hold of the, of the horns of salvation and you make sure that there's no spot or blemish or any such thing in you. And you go to the Lamb of God and you say, Search me, O oh God. Know my heart, O oh God. You have a fear of the Spirit of God being cast from you when you're a child of God and you're of God. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Another, I uh, just said, one of my little thoughts I wrote down as far as it says, only that which is maintained will endure and will remain. No wonder we got to be careful who we, let, we allow to preach and teach and what we listen to and what we give our amen to. The minute that the first clown ever stood up in a pulpit and said, I found a way around Jesus Christ's name baptism. The first clown that ever stood up and said, I found a way around being full of the Holy Ghost. The first clown that said, well, I have found a way that all you have to do is absolutely nothing to be saved. That is the first time that you should have went to God and said, God, I'm turning them over to Satan for their admonition and for their being made straight in your eyes. We haven't been bold enough. We haven't been guarded enough. The thing that we should have been guarded against isn't the fear of somebody preaching the straight, sound, simplistic doctrine. Brother, I've heard them. I've heard them say stuff like, like all they preach down there is Acts 2.38. I've heard them say they can't get past Acts 2.38. I can't get past Acts 2.38 because it's where I found the power of God. It's where I found the blood of Jesus Christ. It's where I found the remission of sins is Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 is where I found reason and hope not to give up on preaching. When I went to an altar one night and I said, God, I don't want to preach anymore because there's no joy in it. There's no unction in it, God. I don't understand how people get excited about you. But God miraculously yes. filled me with the Holy Ghost at an yes. altar. And it was all because of the Word. All because of Acts 2.38. All because of the simplicity of the doctrine. Those that would say Acts 2.38 isn't enough are no different than the ones that would say, well, a little scrimmage game of football on the field isn't good enough to have joy. It's got to have life. It's got to have millions of dollars. It's got to have TV. It's the same concept. Everything that man toils with, he wants to destroy the simplicity of it. Yes. Yes. I laugh about it. That this has nothing to do with right or wrong, but, but there's an old Tommy thing in a little town that, that me and Pete can identify with. Brother, there, there's a little thing called Labor Day. Years ago, it was simplistic. It was, let's have a race around the block with the little kids. It was, let's turn a greasy pig loose and see which kid can catch it. Let's uh, put a turtle in the middle of a, a circle and see which turtle runs to the ring. It was simplistic things. It was grown men sucking on a suck bottle to see who could suck a suck bottle now, like the mayor, the fire chief, and things like that. But man wasn't happy with the simplicity of what brought the community together in communication. They brought a big carnival in. I don't even really want anything to do with that particular celebration anymore because it has nothing to do with the simplicity and the joy that it started out of celebrating what was called Labor Day. I'm not saying it's wrong bringing, it, bringing the carnival in, but it's simplistic. 
its design of what it was originally meant for is no longer there. It's no more than a money-making little fair that you see anywhere. There's nothing special about it anymore. Carnival rides and things like that. Not nothing about us anymore, but about the almighty dollar. But I digress and I get off that, but, but I just use that as an example. Man ruins everything that they tamper with for their betterment and for their pocket enrichment. The gospel is no different. The gospel is no different. Luke chapter 5, verse 36 to 39, I believe would follow the same type of concept here. Chapter 5, 36 through 39. And he spake also a parable unto them, Jesus talking. No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old. If otherwise in both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agrees not with the old. No man putteth new wine in the old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put in the new bottles. Both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, The old is better. Amen. Jesus talking. Talking about the new wine needs to go in the new skin. You can't be preaching the gospel to people that they have the new convert, new born again experience, but there's nothing changed about them. You cannot take the old bottle. You cannot take the old sinful flesh that has not been washed clean in the name of Jesus Christ and declare it clean enough to contain and walk with and to stand with and to bear with Jesus Christ. There's too much glory. There's too much uh, shouting to be done. There's too much expression of happiness to be shared with others for you to put the joy of God into something that doesn't want to bend and doesn't want to give. I'm going to tell you it will burst. It will crack. It will bring pain and severe hardship to the one that isn't ready to contain the Holy Ghost. No wonder so many people fall away before they're completely birthed into this world. As uh, Pastor Gary used to preach here years ago uh, about, about dry births and things like that, the church is trying to have dry births. They're trying to have births that don't come naturally, not according to Acts 2.38, not according to Acts chapter... Uh, 8.16, not according to Acts chapter 19 and, and about verse 48 through the end, not according to being washed in the blood and being buried in the name of Jesus Christ in your burial, not according to rising in the newness and walking with God according to His glory. This, this whole plan, this whole simplistic plan that I'm talking about. Turn it over to uh, Mark chapter 16. Amen. Mark 16 and well quoted. I'll leave off with some scriptures after this point, but I'm going to read 15 till the end, which is about 19. It said, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak yes. with new tongues. Yes. Yes. They shall take up serpents. Mm -hmm. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. 
So then after the Lord had spoken to them, He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. We're talking about the simple salvation plan. Jesus never in all of his teaching and all of his parables <coughs> never told us to do 80% of what we see people do today. And I'm not a mean-spirited person, but I am a truthful person. If I be wrong about some of this, only God Almighty can, can straighten me up on some of these thoughts. Sometimes I go out on my own thing and I say my thoughts according to spending so much time with God. I believe today, and this is very bold what I'm going to say, and I, and I wouldn't say it if I wasn't feeling the Holy Ghost so strong, but these churches have substituted the move of God for two equal-sized screens on the wall. They thought, well, if I put a 40-inch uh, LG uh, screen TV over here and I put a 40-inch one, I've seen churches with their 100-inch TVs in the center. That is not nothing to do with Jesus Christ. That has not nothing to do with just following the world and looking good for the world. I would to God, I mean it with all my heart, all these tapestries, all these things that men need to lay down and go back to the old ways and consider the old ways and consider their past. The former house had so much glory compared to the latter. The house that man has tried to present as, as modern day Pentecost does not have the same glory as the glory that started on the day of Pentecost. It does not have the same glory. It doesn't have the same healing. It doesn't have the same zeal. It doesn't have the same desire. It's placebo. It's antichrist. It's fake Christ. You have lost faith in God when you think that putting a TV screen on your wall is going to make a difference to the move of God in a church. You have lost faith in God when you think that it takes a one certain person to be exalted to a high level to see the move of God. I'm saying this by faith, and I don't know who it goes to. I don't. I'm not saying it for the sake of being controversial. But I'm saying it for the sake of being 100% honest in the Holy Ghost today. I've never in my life hardly ever seen certain exalted people in the church. Like a, let's just say an exalted pastor. I've never once said, you know, this brother knew he got called to preach a week ago. He's the one that's preaching yeah, tonight. Yeah. Not me. I've done it all yeah. my life. It's the one that, that got saved and full of the Holy Ghost and called to preach one week ago to the day. Yeah. We're going to let him say something for God today. Thank my God. point being, I'm, I'm going to a, a, a very exaggerated example to make my point that it's become all about us. It's become all about the move is us. The way I do it is us. The screens on the wall is us. The way that we turn our music so loud that you can't even think. That's God. No, it's not God. If you have to turn the music up so loud that you can't even think, you're just, you're just trying to trance the people. You're trying to fool them into thinking God's in the building. If God's in the building, you're going to feel it. You're going to know it. You're going to hope it. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, God. Well, glory, I'm like a, like a wound up eight-day clock right now. I really feel it. I'm happy about this. Thank you, Jesus. I really struggled about this, about about the anointing, you've got to reach in deep within yourself yes, to pull yes. the anointing out. Yes, you've got to lay it all out on the line to let the anointing come out. Yes. You've got to have no fear of man or no thoughts to let the anointing come out. Yes, and the only way you get to that point is understand that perfect love casts out fear. Yes, and the only perfect love there is is Jesus yes, Christ. Yes. The only perfect love I've ever found in my life is Jesus Christ. Yes, He's my Father today, He says. He's the one that's been a father to me. He's the one that taught me how to be a man. He's the one that taught me how to be a good husband to, to my wife. He's the one that teaches me how to, to be around my grandchildren. He's the one that teaches me all these things. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Finally, as far as what I feel like 
God would want Sandra to preach today. I know we're small in number at this church, but a statement of vision, that's just simply why I got wrote down a statement of vision. And I got it in an uh, exclamation point, a statement of vision. I can only speak to myself, and I hope, and I would pray and know, because it's not meant to be any certain way other than just a statement of vision. I would hope that someone would get a hold of this statement and believe the same way and be in agreement. The Bible says, if any two or three agree on any one thing, that it will come to pass. Uh, another scripture says, Whatsoever you bind in earth is yes. bound in heaven. Yes. Yes. When he's talking to Peter about him having the keys of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. But a statement of vision. I don't want to keep going through any motions. I want to see people filled with the Holy Ghost. I want a time of reaping. Yes. I want to see a time of plenty. I want to see the hurt and the lost and the people that don't know the right from the left. I want to see them come to the Word of God. I want to see healings like we... I want it to be noise of God that healings are taking place yes, at the Little Lord. Bear Creek yes, Apostolic yes. Church. I want it to be said that healings... I don't want it to be said... Uh, well, Brother Smith preaches down there. Isn't he a good preacher? I want him to say, that little church down in the country, they're seeing people healed. They're seeing yes. people filled with yes. the Holy Ghost. Yes. They yes. believe in God. Yes. They don't compromise the Word. They believe the Word. They stand on the Word. Yes. While the other day we went there, and, and before we even walked in the door, so-and-so was healed. Before we even walked in the door, so-and-so was filled. Before we even walked in the door, a financial miracle came our way. Thank you. I don't want to set a new standard with new wine. I don't want to do things like other churches have done. I want to do things in a very Jesus Christ manner. Yes, if Acts 2.38 preaching isn't good enough to do it, there is nothing good enough to do it. I don't want to, to fall prey to say, well, it's because we don't have the right singers. We don't have the right preaching. We don't have the right cues. We don't have the right lighting. We don't have the right sound system. We don't have the right program. If Jesus Christ doesn't bless the little church, it's going to be for one reason. Acts 2.38 was left in the dirt. That's right. That's right. Jesus Christ's name was left in the dirt. One Lord, one faith, one baptism was left in the yeah. dirt. Yeah. My statement of vision is that God would raise up a standard in this little 20 by 20 square building and that it would be standing room only. Yes, Jesus. Nothing in my vision has anything to do with money. Nothing in my vision has anything to do with fame or acclaim. It has to do with the lost and dying world. A world that's going to hell in a handbag. Yes, a world that cannot even see how dark things have become. Yes, yes. A statement of vision. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. A statement of vision. Without a vision, the people perish. Amen. But I want you to know, at least for me, when I'm preaching in this pulpit, when I'm testifying, if I'd be part of the audience or if I would be singing a song, whatever it is, it's got one purpose, one goal. It's no different than the one purpose and one goal that we should all have 24-7. That someone would be filled with the Holy Ghost. Someone would be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Someone would be healed. Someone would take up serpent and not be hurt. Someone would drink a deadly poison and not be hurt if it be an honor and a missionship of doing the Lord's will. That a hedge of protection would be around Bear Creek. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I don't see how that the gospel can be hid at this little church. Okay. All we got to do is start noising it abroad more and more. Yeah. God will do the rest. God will do the rest. I know God, is, and I'm sure it's other places in the world. But God spoke to my heart. I was praying, and it ain't just this place, it's other places. Hear me with respect and honor for God with what I'm getting ready to say. This, this is hard to say. This is for this place and a million like it. The devil has seen little buildings just like this one and what they were dedicated for. Yep. Yep. 
I know when I give honor and respect where honor and respect is due. Uh, the former pastor here that, that passed away, I know that the man's heart, he wanted people to be filled with the Holy Ghost in this building. He wanted people to be healed and to made right and to be right and to do right. It wasn't a, a, meant to be a building of any judgment or any disrespect. But that gets the devil's attention. Yeah. And he assigns a little minion to this dominion. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't care if they only have one service every six months. I've got one of my imps from hell assigned to that building to keep God from moving there. Well, I'm here to tell you, devil, you're being put on notice by the Holy Ghost. God has shown me the deception and the deceitery and the way that, that the lack of faith has crept in. And that God is here to say, I'm here to hold a candle up. I'm here to hold a match up. I'm here to shine a light on things. I'm here to do this today, says the Lord. I'm here to do this to show. See, we think it was nothing. But God showed me in Holy Ghost and Holy Prayer that there would have been a demon assigned to this building to watch and patrol this building and to always be jabbing and provoking and prodding it to make it not ever reach its full potential. But we're aware of this now. We're aware of it. The Word is bringing it out. Yes, a vision, a, a statement of vision. I want it to be so, and I want, I want the small crowd here to not to remember this, if it be very shortly that this comes to pass. I want you to remember me saying this. I want there to be the night that we come in here and no one can stand because of the power of God. I want everybody to say, you remember that night? You remember when we really weren't feeling much? You remember when we was only four or five in number and we weren't really feeling much and wondering where it was going to go? Look around now. Everybody is slain in the Holy Ghost. Everybody got their prayers answered tonight. Everybody got filled with the Holy Ghost. Everybody's in one mind and one accord. Yes, Lord. Praise you. The final thing about my statement of vision is not none of this is possible unless we be in agreement. Right. Unless any two or three be in That's agreement. Right. There's right. no way that any two of us can't come into full agreement and these things not come to pass. Right. Thank you, so if you're in agreement tonight, the way you show that you're in agreement is through your prayers, through your dedication, yes. through your support. But let's pray that we be in that one mind and one accord. Let's not, and I say respectfully, I, it's never my job. I preach the same way no matter where I preach or who I preach to. But I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm just saying that's the way it is. That's the word God's given me tonight. We can't minimalize the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't put it in a little box. If we put it in a little box, It'll go down to some other place where it's not in a box and there's where it will flourish. And we can't be discouraged about what we do see flourishing. Mm -hmm. All that says, Lord, Lord, will not enter into heaven. Right. But he that does the Father's will will enter into heaven. I praise the name of Jesus Christ tonight. I, I feel like this has been a very uh, a good word, a very sincere word. Oh, yes. But consider... Consider, at least tonight, from the perspective of consider the first house, if we would just consider the first house being the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. I want Bear Creek Apostolic to measure itself against the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. If we come up anything short of the day of Pentecost, we have come up short because it is all, it says, and as many as shall call on the Lord God is who the gift is for. That meant the people at Battle Creek Apostolic. That meant the people at, at, at Durban Apostolics all across the America, White Creek Apostolics, all these little fundamental, independent, Jesus Christ named church. This is the same word that goes out to all of them today. God has allowed and set back and seen what would be allowed. Yes, and what has been allowed is the church has crept down in fear of how great and how much potential this gospel has. Uh -huh. Fear not, little flock. Fear not, little flock. Yes. You are about to do some great things if you yes. can just see the potential of the gospel. Fear not, my little flock. Jesus. Well, glory. I feel that so strong. 
Fear not, little flock. Fear not. Fear not. Goliath is big, but Goliath, you know who Goliath is right now? Yeah. Goliath is that person down there that's struggling with homosexuality, that you're afraid to invite to church because of them maybe struggling with it. You have forgot that God can knock that completely down and He can raise them up a new person. Yes, He can. Yes, he can. The two people living in sin that you know, that's become our life. We've become afraid of them. Yes. We've, we've lost the, the eyesight that God has the cure for all these things. Yes, Jesus. But fear not, little flock. The Lord is amongst us to do great and marvelous works. Yes, great and marvelous works He will do. I think the saddest thing in, in the life to do, and I'll, I'll close on this and we'll have a, an, an altar of a, a prayer and everything. But one of the saddest things you can do, and the devil wants you to do it, is to underestimate your potential. That's right, that's right. To underestimate your potential. To think small of yourself. I don't say the name, but the sister that sings for us here in this little church, the anointing in the songs that you sing yes, were wrote from the heart. Yes, Jesus. They could break down the meanest man there is. They could break down the wickedest woman that's ever walked. I'm talking about music that, that goes in with the sword of God and cuts and divides and pierces. And I say respectfully, because I'm not saying that anyone's done this, but if you ever think, well, my songs are just some homespun, uh, hillbilly wrote songs, they're not going to help nobody. You're not thinking big enough for our God. You've got to think, my songs could see America on its knees yes, repenting. Yes. My testimony could see America on its knees repenting. Yes, My preaching could, could see people on their knees repenting. Jesus. My attending that little humble church could be the key to whole counties getting saved. Yes, Father. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. I close now in the name of Jesus Christ. Sis, would you come with the song tonight?